we all set? I think it's especially fitting that we come together at UCEA to celebrate the work of Hannah Mawinney and to celebrate a life well lived. Because UCA was Hannah's primary professional home. And uh, it's a home that she loved and cared for and served faithfully and diligently, not only in those visible leadership positions that she assumed, but in those less visible uh, roles where all of the grunt work that keeps an organization afloat gets carried out. While Hannah has had uh, our primary home in UCEA, she's occupied many residences. Um, on her journey, to borrow Emily's words, from a beloved classroom teacher to an internationally respected scholar. You see, Hannah was a curious and a creative and a rangy scholar whose work spanned the domains of leadership, policy, politics, and international and comparative education. And in each of these areas, and in every one of these areas, she was able to push the theoretical boundaries, she was able to address neglected issues, she was able to prepare for developments that few of us saw coming, but that she predicted well. And she was able to distill the implications of her work for policy and practice. But most importantly, in each and all of these areas of her work, she invited us to create more, more inclusive, compassionate, and cosmopolitan communities. The streams of work that we will highlight here in this session illustrate some of the contributions that Hannah has made to the profession. But I suspect for many of us, her countless acts of kindness, as well as the very special grace with which she lived her life and faced her fate, may be the most inspiring, enduring, and endearing contributions of her legacy. So today we honor a remarkable person as well as a remarkable scholar who is a genuine leader and a genuine steward of the field. We're going to begin with her daughter's reflections. Emily is here from Minneapolis. And then we're going to move to reflections by Michelle and Sue and Catherine. And then Catherine will speak on behalf of Bob Krausen, who at the last moment was unable to attend, and close with David Matthews. The reflections that people share here today will be published in a special issue of the UCA Bulletin, preserved on Hannah's behalf and for her family, as well as for the profession. At the close of our comments, we will certainly invite any of you who wish to share remembrances to be an active part of this session. So thank you for your attendance, and let us welcome Emily Lewinney. Thank you, Betty. I'm honored to have the opportunity to join my mother's colleagues and friends to pay tribute to her life and the work about which she was so passionate. Although it is a difficult task, I'm pleased to be here today with all of you to reflect on the life and work of an extraordinary woman. How can we capture the essence of a career in education that spanned 48 years, two continents, and ranged from a grade five class in a small town in northern Alberta to a doctoral class in the shadow of Washington, D.C., and so much more. My mother's colleagues and former students are better able to speak about her contributions to scholarship in the areas of leadership, policy, politics, and comparative education. I would like to reflect on the journey that transformed my mother from a beloved classroom teacher to an internationally respected scholar and shaped much of her research. Sharing my mother's journey with you now as we reflect on her legacy is important for several reasons. First, my mother was a compassionate listener and could elicit the life story from anyone who stopped to talk with her for a few minutes. 
but she did not share the story of her own journey very widely. Second, a closer look at my mother's journey reveals a central theme that I see reflected in much of her life's work, the idea of building cosmopolitan communities. As we now struggle to move forward in a world without my mother's gentle guidance and passionate curiosity, I hope that the many dimensions of her cosmopolitan identity will provide a framework for those who wish to continue the work that she left behind. My, my mother embodied the idea of cosmopolitanism in every sense of the word. She was literally a citizen of the world and dedicated her career to the idea of building inclusive cosmopolitan communities through civic engagement. But what is a cosmopolitan community? As an adventurous interdisciplinarian, my mother would look to political philosophy to explain cosmopolitanism. In simple terms, cosmopolitanism is commonly understood as the idea that all people, regardless of their political affiliation, cultural or normative differences, should be engaged participants in a global community of citizens. The commonalities in that global community may be constructed through shared moral norms, political institutions, or universal laws. In the 21st century, cosmopolitanism has become intertwined with globalization, and one idea cannot be fully understood without the other. In my mother's words, quote, cosmopolitanism today cannot be understood without reference to the social, cultural, political, and economic features of the modern globalized era, an era defined by an unprecedented interconnectedness in which identities, ideas, cultures, and politics are embedded in the global and the transnational. Cosmopolitanism and globalization were compelling ideas for my mother because of her own global journey and her transnational identity. Born in the tiny seaside village of Tisted, Denmark, my mother immigrated to Canada when she was a child. She sailed to Halifax, Nova Scotia, before traveling by train across Canada to Calgary, Alberta. That epic voyage, filled with giant icebergs and genuine cowboys in the still wild west, was the first step on my mother's transformative journey to becoming cosmopolitan. As a new immigrant trying to make a home in a foreign land, my mother did not encounter an inclusive, welcoming community. She worked hard to lose her Danish accent and quickly constructed a new Canadian identity so that she would be accepted. She was successful in transforming herself into a Canadian. However, I believe her innately cosmopolitan soul was troubled by the idea of a closed cultural door. That moment of cultural exclusion influenced my mother profoundly and set her on a path toward the lifelong exploration of cosmopolitanism. Fortunately, by the 1950s, Canadian society was itself undergoing a period of transformation, and soon the cultural norm of multiculturalism became a significant and defining force in Canadian culture. When my mother embarked on her teaching career in the 1960s, her classrooms were significantly multicultural, and she was able to begin her work building cosmopolitan communities in a more welcoming cultural setting. In her multicultural classrooms in Vancouver, British Columbia, my mother first began to wonder how, quote, cosmopolitan civic education might provide a basis for creating civic literacy in a global context, end quote. In 1984, my mother encountered a second cultural roadblock when my family moved to Ottawa, the heart of bilingual Canada. After teaching for more than a decade and earning accolades for her transformative teaching style, my mother could not get a job teaching in Ottawa because she did not speak French. Instead of letting that cultural obstacle stop her, my mother became a cultural explorer in true cosmopolitan fashion and forged ahead to begin her career in academia. She was accepted into the doctoral program at the University of Ottawa, a Francophone university founded by Jesuits, and began a research pro project examining provincial policy changes in Ontario, which extended full funding to Catholic schools and created a French language school board in Ottawa. Her dissertation entitled 
an interpretive framework for understanding the politics of policy change, won the T.B. Greenfeld Dissertation Award from the Canadian Association for the Study of Educational Administration, and was widely cited in the field as a seminal text, though sadly it was never published. Undeterred by the fact that she was neither Francophone nor Catholic, my mother sought to find ways to build bridges across linguistic, religious, and cultural divides in the culturally complex bilingual community in Ottawa. My mother became an advocate for inclusive cultural diversity and worked hard to create and celebrate opportunities for engaged participation by cosmopolitan citizens in the community that once excluded her. For some, the initial moment of cultural rejection which she encountered would have been an insurmountable roadblock, not for my mother. Her endlessly resilient spirit and cosmopolitan identity inspired my mother to forge her own path toward cultural inclusion. After earning her doctorate, she joined the Faculty of Education at the University of Ottawa and even served as acting dean in that faculty. And in the most decisive act of cosmopolitanism that proved no cultural roadblock could stop her, my mother learned to speak French. The transformative experience of creating a home for herself in a Francophone Catholic community shaped my mother's understanding of the value of building inclusive cosmopolitan communities in profound ways. In 1999, my mother immigrated for the third time in her life, this time to the United States. That cultural transition went more smoothly than the others, perhaps because of the welcoming community my mother joined at the University of Maryland and because cosmopolitan ideals were en vogue, thanks to the growing power of globalization. During that time, my mother became inspired to research the phenomenon of civic education within the framework of cosmopolitan communities. She was interested in the intersection of social, economic, and political forces on the communities in which schools are located. My mother was concerned that the forces of globalization and the emergence of global techno spaces would erode the cosmopolitan ideal of civic engagement because the new techno citizens would be uncertain about the community to which they belonged. However, my mother saw the potential for technology to empower citizens to engage in deliberative democracy in their conventional political communities and in their techno communities long before Twitter became a tool for sparking a revolution. She also saw a need to prepare educational leaders to help students build the deliberative democratic skills necessary to navigate those new techno global, global techno spaces. My mother became a passionate advocate for civic literacy education as a way to balance old cultural attachments while developing new civic identities in cosmopolitan communities to better manage the demands of globalization. She was deeply honored to be appointed by Governor Ehrlich to the Maryland Commission on Civic Literacy in 2007 to continue that work. I recall her beaming with pride when she announced she had the opportunity to influence policy on a subject about which she was so passionate. That dedication to civic literacy education transitioned into research on issues of inclusion and social justice in some of her last research with one of her doctoral students, David DeMatthews. She was happy to know that the next generation of scholars will continue to explore the evolving dimensions of social justice within the framework of cosmopolitanism. As I now reflect on the arc of my mother's life and career, I can see her cosmopolitan identity inspired her to advocate for civic education, inclusion, and social justice as a way to make school communities more welcoming for the little girl from Denmark who is thrust into an unfriendly foreign world by the forces of globalization. In the months since my mother's passing, I have often wondered how to move forward I have often wondered how to move forward in a world without her hopeful smile 
her curious spirit, and her ability to find a way around any closed door. The world definitely seems like a darker place without her, but I realize she would not want that to be the case. She would not want things to fall apart in her absence. My mother once wrote, quote, the possibility that things fall apart under conditions of localization stands in contrast to the hopefulness engendered by stances of vernacular cosmopolitanism. She always had a way with words. My mother was a hopeful cosmopolitan and she would want all of us to be hopeful and cosmopolitan too. She believed the way forward in the era of globalization is to build dynamic cosmopolitan communities full of engaged global citizens, well-versed in civic literacy. To do that, she would be tweeting and exploring social media as an amazing tool of civic engagement. She would be mentoring educational leaders at the nexus of emerging citizens and inclusive communities. She would be writing about social justice as a form of public governance well suited in the age of cosmopolitanism. But most importantly, she would be listening. My mother was an empathetic and careful listener with a gift for inspiring all those who shared their stories with her to follow their dreams and to dream big. She would want us to continue to dream about the amazing potential that is generated by inclusive cosmopolitan thinking. And she would want us to accept the torch she has passed and continue her work building cosmopolitan communities. Thank you. I was um, very honored to be asked last winter to um, speak at uh, Hannah's Celebration of Life, which was held on Valentine's Day. And um, today I'm going to share with you an excerpt from my remarks that I shared that day. I was fortunate to have known Hannah for almost 20 years. She was incredibly important, obviously, in the lives of many of our colleagues, and she left her mark on us in numerous ways. She was a significant scholar, a dedicated mentor, a model of servant leadership, and a true friend. I met Hannah when I was a graduate student in 1995. I was perched at the edge of my seat as she was presenting a policy archeology span focused on school violence. It was heady, high theory work, what I didn't know then was that she had already had over 25 years of teaching and leadership experience in the Ontario K-12 and higher education system. And I learned over the next 20 years that Hannah was uncommonly gifted at taking high theory and thinking through its practical applications. Hannah's sense of commitment to making a positive impact was apparent in all aspects of her life in her scholarly life, including her role as a mentor as well. In addition to her work advising graduate students at the University of Maryland, Hannah also served as a faculty mentor for the Barbara Jackson Scholars Program, for the William Boyd Politics of Education Seminar, as well as for the David Clark Graduate Student Research Seminar. Hannah was the kind of person that people name when they think of a good mentor. She was kind and compassionate. She was well-read and able to coach students who, met, who she had just met through difficult conceptual issues and direct them to relevant research. Additionally, she supported countless student scholarship, helping them get published, laboriously editing their, editing their papers, and never asked or expected anything in return. She was this way with her colleagues as well, always there always there when you needed her. She was a great listener. She was warm and compassionate and wise. I benefited from her wisdom countless times. 
Hannah's passing represents an enormous loss for this field. UCEA in particular has benefited from Hannah's keen insight, her strong leadership, and her tireless commitment to the organization. Hannah represented the University of Maryland on the UCA plenum from 1999 to 2013 when she was elected to the UCA Executive Committee. She represented UCEA on the Audit and Steering Committee for the Education Leadership Licensure Consortium, the organization that accredits leadership preparation programs for six years. She spent countless hours reviewing program preparation materials and never was ever paid for any of that service. She attended countless meetings in Washington, D.C. as a representative of UCEA headquarters simply because she knew somebody needed to be there. She published in and was reviewed a reviewer for and served on the editorial board for EAQ and other UCEA journals and was a member of the UCEA Publications Committee. In 2011, Hannah received a service award from UCEA for her leadership in developing the 2011 ELCC standards for school and district leadership. However, we could have recognized her yearly for at least 10 years of the different services that she had given to UCEA and went above and beyond the call of duty. It was um, of significant um, happiness that we named the UCEA Service Award in Hannah's name earlier this year. Like some of you here today, I am angry that cancer took her from us and I am sad at the thought that I will never again be greeted by her smile, share a knowing glance across a policy board meeting table, talk strategy or celebrate a small victory or achievement. After sending out the announcement of her passing, UCA received so many, many expressions of sadness, shock, and sympathy, and many colleagues shared impressions and memories as well. And I'll just share three briefly. Mary Canole, who worked with Hannah and myself on the um, policy board briefly from the Council of Chief State School Officers said, Hannah will be missed so much. She was quite an educator and she touched all of us. Mariela Rodriguez from UT San Antonio and a member of the UCA executive board said, this is truly sad news. I've always remember Hannah for her grace and the respect with which she treated all of those with whom she encountered. Jim Sabolka, a formal, former colleague of hers, said, Hannah and I published together in years past. I recruited her to the University of Maryland. She was a discerning scholar, a colleague who placed a priority on service to our profession and a wonderfully accepting and positive individual. She will be greatly missed, but fondly remembered by many of us. Selfishly, I ache at the thought of a future without her. She was such a good friend, a solid colleague, a wise and caring person, and it is rare to find such a wonderful combination and I'm so glad that I did. The field of education and leadership in particular was fortunate to have had a committed leader like Hannah with us. And even, <clears throat> I can't read this. <laughs> and even <clears throat> the significant legacy that she left in her wake, she still left us far too soon. Thank you.
Hi, everybody. I'm Sue Winton. I'm at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And I'd just like to begin by thanking Catherine, Michelle, and Betty for inviting me to contribute today to this special session and to by expressing my sincere condolences to Emily, other members of Hannah's family, and her many friends. And I'd also just like to thank um, Cherry Chan, a doctoral student at York, and Professor Ken Breen, the president of the Canadian Association for Studies in Educational Administration, both of whom helped me put together the remarks I'm about to present today. Um, so I'm pleased to have an opportunity to share and reflect upon Hannah's early academic career accomplishments and contributions in Canada. So I met Hannah at UCEA's convention in Anaheim, California in 2009. It was one of my first UCEA conventions and I only knew a handful of people. I recognized Carolyn Shields from conferences I'd attended in Canada and I asked her if I could join her at a social event and sit with her and others at a table. There she introduced me to Hannah as a fellow Canadian scholar who was now working in the USA. And I recall asking them both for advice about how to thrive in both national scholarly contexts. And as I returned to work and began pursuing research on policy advocacy, I discovered that Hannah and I had much more in common than just dual citizenship. We shared an interest in the politics of education in general and in interest groups in particular. And I've read and reread her 2001 article, Theoretical Approaches to Understanding Interest Groups, numerous times. And I eagerly received her generous feedback on a chapter I wrote on the politics of interest groups for the book, uh, Political Context of Educational Leadership, that was co-published by UCEA last year. So I share these moments with you in part so you can see how Hannah influenced me personally, but also because I think they reflect some of the themes of her work. Policy influences, politics of education, and collaboration. So I'm just now going to turn to a brief description of her early academic career and contributions in Canada. Um, Hannah completed her master's and her doctoral degrees at the University of Ottawa, as we've heard, in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, her master's thesis, called A Political System Strategy to Analyze Policy Formation, was completed under the supervision of the late Dr. Harold Jakes. Her study was an analysis of Ontario's Bill 109. That's the bill that created Ontario's French Language School Board. And the study identified a, rich, a need for rich descriptions of the uniqueness of each Canadian promise, province excuse me, and territory, and emphasized the significance of social context. Ultimately, she proposed a political systems approach to policy analysis. This master's thesis won the Canadian Association for Studies in Educational Administration's Best Master's Thesis Award in 1990. And she published her proposed political systems approach with Dr. Jakes in the Journal of Thought that same year. And in this study, we can see themes and interests that Hannah would continue to investigate over her career, including interest groups and power and policy processes and the importance of context. Uh, in particular, her thesis includes a discussion of different meanings of power. And as Emily mentioned, uh, her, uh, Hannah's dis doctoral dissertation was called an interpretive framework for understanding the politics of policy change. And here she also examined some significant policy changes in Ontario, the introduction of full public funding of Roman Catholic secondary schools, and the creation of a French language school board in Ottawa Carleton. And again, she investigated the politics of policy changes although this time she adopted a view of policy problems as social constructions. Uh, her doctoral studies were supported by what we know in Canada to, Canada to be a prestigious Social Science and Humanities Research Council Fellowship and a University of Ottawa Merit Scholarship. Uh, her research uh, again won the Canadian Association for Studies in Educational Administrations uh, an award this time for her dissertation in 1994. And in here, we can, in this work, we can see um, Hannah reject the rational explanation, explanations of policy pro processes and propose an interpretive framework as an alternative. This framework contributed to, as she calls it, debate on the nature and the influence of contextual forces and gave rise to important revisions to the popular advocacy coalition framework as acknowledged by some of its key theorists, Sabatier and Jenkins Smith. It also contributed to neo-institutional theory by demonstrating the importance of the state in models of public policy making. And in this work, we also see Hannah's deep engagement with theory. Of course, we know she continued to engage in this way throughout her professional career. In fact, one of my last meetings with Hannah was at a conversation session she led at UCEA's 2013 convention in Indianapolis. And this conversation was an exploration of the possibility of using Hannah Arendt's work in educational leadership. 
So as again, as we've heard, after completing her graduate studies, Hannah stayed on at the University of Ottawa. Her research continued to examine institutional influences on policy processes in Ontario, both drawing on and extending new institutional theories. For example, she explored institutional influences on and outcomes of collaboration in three Ontario high schools. Her work demonstrated that while it is the case that institutional beliefs can explain some of the coherence and orderliness of schools, it's also true that these beliefs can be contested. She noted that sustained collaborations between organizations give rise to complicated issues of communication, power and control. Her study of the efforts of individuals in a school highlighted the role that educational leaders can play in facilitating collaborative initiatives through strategic decision making. While she also demonstrated the complexity of institutional constraints on an individual advocacy's efforts. Finally, in a discussion of her study of interagency collaboration, she pointed out the inability of policy processes grounded in rationalism to address community building or communities, and she called instead for processes that involved community-oriented and democratic processes in the pursuit of identifying shared values. And here I think we can see the commitment to democracy that analyzes much of Hannah's work. Uh, Hannah's careful considerations of theory, again, both of what they offer as well as their shortcomings, is again evident in a piece that she published in the Canadian Journal of Educational Administration and Policy in 1995. In this article, um, called Towards an Archaeology of Policy that Challenges Conventional Framing of the Policy of Violence in Schools, Hannah revisits the ideas about social construction of policy problems that she raised in her doctoral dissertation. She revisits post-structuralism, Oh, sorry, she reviews post-structuralism, post-modernism, and their influence on new ways of investigating and understanding social phenomena. Finding much potential in the approach of, of policy genealogy proposed by Foucault and in Shurek's policy archaeology, she calls for an analysis of the problem of school violence and related policies in Canada. And here again, we see Hannah's interests in policy, theory, politics, and power. So this review of Hannah's work undertaking while living in Canada is absolutely incomplete. And I encourage you all to read or to revisit some of her early contributions to the Scholarship of Educational Administration. But I think more important than these contributions to the field, however, are Hannah's contributions to her Canadian colleagues. So I just wanted to end today um, by sharing some of the words of Hannah's colleagues and friends from across Canada. So Janice Wallace is a professor at the University of Alberta, and she shares that Hannah was a great supporter of new scholars and served as an example to so many of us. When I was in Richard Townsend's course at OISE, I was assigned Hannah's doctoral thesis for review and presentation. It was a tomb, very long, absolutely thorough, and so well analyzed that I was a bit daunted by it when I thought about the work that I was about to embark on for my own thesis. I had a question while preparing my assignment, which I emailed to her, and she was so generous in her response. Hannah was tireless in her own work and in her support of other scholars. She worked so hard to encourage strong scholarship in the Canadian Association for the Study of Educational Administration and the Canadian Association for the Study of Women in Education, even when she had moved to the US and was actively engaged there as well. I had the pleasure of meeting her for breakfast at the Beverly Hotel when we were both in Vancouver to teach at the University of British Columbia. And I still remember that sunny old dining room and the wonderful conversation we had about ideas and family and the rigors of the academic life. She will be deeply missed, but her ideas and influence will live on through her students and colleagues whom she touched so deeply. John Young, a professor at the University of Manitoba, described Hannah as an important Canadian educational administration scholar and a good friend. Generous in her support of colleagues and students, someone I always look forward to, catching up with at the Canadian Society for Studies and Education. Lynn Bosetti, a professor at the University of British Columbia, explains that she's been a colleague for a very long time and has made a significant contribution to our field. We'll miss her energy, generosity, mentorship, and sharp intellect. This reminds me to embrace the day and take time for each other. Uh, Wendy Poole, who's also a professor at the University of British Columbia, says that Hannah's work in policy studies is memorable. She tackled complex and politically difficult issues in unique ways. She was a master at creating word clouds for her presentations to capture abstract ideas. However, it is Hannah's humanity that I will remember most about her. Hannah was a caring and selfless human being who made time to listen, 
She reached out to individuals experiencing tough times in their lives or careers and courageously engaged with the emotional world from which others might shy away. In her unassuming way, she made a difference in the lives of people around her. Sharon Cook, a professor at the University of Ottawa, says, I knew Hannah from the time she did her grad work at Ottawa University and thought very highly of her. Hannah approached life with a huge stock of enthusiasm. She saw possibilities in scholarship and in service that others did not see or were, who, or were too focused on their own careers to care. She always went far beyond the norm. In supervising students, she took more on and she did more with, most, with them than most of us. In writing papers, she wrote and rewrote far into the night, eager to offer a polished presentation. And anyone who has roomed with her at conferences knows how hard she worked that printer until dawn. <laughs> at social gatherings, she met everyone in the room and then managed to remember their names. Hannah had a huge appetite for life. We wish she had had more time to enjoy the quiet times as well as those running at sonic speed. Her life was too short. She, was much, she is much missed amongst her former colleagues and students at the University of Ottawa. Now I'm just going to close um, with some words from Professor Jim Ryan, who's at OISE at the University of Toronto, and he writes, I first met Hannah at a Canadian Society for Studies and Education conference at Carleton University in Ottawa many years ago when she was a student. Even back then, she seemed to know everyone. Although I had never met her before, she talked to me as though we were old friends. In time, we actually did become old friends. There are many things that I will remember about Hannah. One is her easygoing, friendly demeanor. She was always welcoming. She would never fail to greet me with a smile and a hug, not always an easy thing to do in the intense field in which we work. Her easy manner, however, sometimes hid her passion for her work. I knew, I knew few people in academia with more passion than Hannah. This passion was evident in the conference discussions in which she participated, in the many opportunities she provided for students and colleagues, in her writing, and of course, in her attendance at every conference under the sun. Without exaggeration, I can say that I have only attended two or three conferences in my entire career after I first met her where she was not present. If anything could have been said to be a fixture at these conferences, it was Hannah. The thing I will most miss most about Hannah is her presence at conferences like CSSE. They will just not be the same for me without her. I cannot help but think, though, that she's probably found her way to a conference or two in the afterlife and doing what she has done so well for the last three decades, enriching the lives of those she meets, making the organizations of which she is a part better places, and generating useful knowledge for the field that she cared so much about. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catherine Lug, and I'm uh, going to be presenting first my stuff, and then with a slight technological shift, present a PowerPoint from uh, Bob Krausen. I first met Hannah in sometime between 1994 and 1995 when I was a doctoral student at Penn State, when she, Bill Boyd, and Bob Krausen were working on the PEA yearbook, The Politics of Education. I hate my glasses. Um, and the new institutionalism. I was completely impressed with her intellectual acumen as well as her sheer delight in playing with ideas. For Hannah, the life of the mind sat squarely in the center of her praxis. And I'm drawing on a slightly larger uh, paper in which I looked at two pieces that she wrote, um, one in 1997 and the other in 2001 with the Politics of Education yearbook that we uh, worked on together. Um, in, the in the 1997 piece, it's entitled Institutionally Women, Institutionalizing Women's Voices, Not Their Echoes, Through Feminist Analysis of Difference. This chapter was part of a larger two-volume book project edited by Catherine Marshall entitled Feminist uh, Cr Critical Policy Analysis. In the other work, Theoretical Approaches to Understanding Interest Groups, um, which is in the larger 2001 PEA yearbook, Hannah maps, the, maps political scientists' approaches to studying interest groups. As such, it's a big overview piece that you want to see in a politics education yearbook, and it's a thankless task. Reading these two pieces together, you can see where Hannah's intellectual terrain, which was vast, did have points of convergence. 
in particular in a field that has been race, gender, class, sexuality, etc., blind in the naming of being bias-free, the politics of education was very late in realizing the influence of the various U.S. social justice movements and that what they influence they had had on several generation of educational, uh, generations of educational scholars, including young politics of ed uh, researchers. Consequently, no one should be surprised that Hannah had embraced uh, difference-based feminism to ground some of her analysis. For instance, she wrote in the 1997 piece that, in the spirit of this feminist myth methodology, I acknowledge my identification with the arguments offered by feminist legal ana analysts and policy experts. I acknowledge this st stance less as a prelude to advocacy that in the spirits of, spirit of modeling a feminist policy analysis of difference, which rejects the tendency of traditional policy analysis to view with suspicion such apparent subjectivity. Clearly, rooted in her own experiences as a female educator, Hannah was a tad suspicious of sociological blind political science theories and policy analysis. She was not the only scholar to critique these supposedly neutral uh, stances. See Marshall, 97, Lopez, 2003. But for scholarly fields as conservative as educational administration, politics of education, educational policy and, and educational policy analysis, Hannah did pursue her own form of radical critique. And I think that this is an important part of Hannah's intellectual legacy. While some of my colleagues, and to be honest myself, are perfectly happy to raise various forms of theoretical and organizational hell, um, Hannah was more comfortable in posing some really uncomfortable questions, which could be even more unsettling. I found this particularly compelling as we, Hannah, Sue Winton, Samantha Scribner, among others, started work on trying to incorporate the writings of Hannah Arendt into educational leadership, policy, and the politics of education. While we were only in the initial stages of this work when I had to step back, it was clear that Hannah was very comfortable in tackling Arendt's approach of thinking without banisters. From my perspective, Hannah's contribution of gently, uh, a co Hannah's combination of gently posing profoundly troubling questions coupled with a fierce intellectual discipline is one of her lasting scholarly contributions. With help from other colleagues, she pried open the scholarly door for more distinctly standpoint grounded analyses of educational leadership, policy, and the politics of education. This is uh, drawn from Bob Krausen's uh, paper. It's Hannah Mawinney and the Politics of Education, a Commentary. And in this longer paper, Bob has uh, maps out some important points. He looks at her 1995 PEA yearbook, and he had known Hannah s since their work on the PEA yearbook, and his paper addresses the following areas. Her work on the um, PEA yearbook from 95, her contributions to uh, community development, and her contributions to the new localism. In this larger paper, Bob is very clear that her, uh, Hannah's analysis was way ahead of its time, sometimes more than 20 years, which that's fairly impressive. Um, 
and he states that she considered the larger side effects and unforeseen organizational implications of a new institutional approach to the study of educational policy making at a time when most of us were fascinated by the, by the theory more than where it would lead us. And what she was concerned with was the unintended effects. And he spends the rest of the paper talking about that. So um, that's all I have. Hello, everybody. Um, Dave DeMatthews. Um, Hannah was my mentor. And in 2007, uh, when I began my doctoral studies at University of Maryland, she was um, the first person I met. Um, and I remember that day. It was <laughs> interesting to meet her in June bef before the semester started as a first-generation college student. Didn't have any idea whatsoever what, what a PhD even meant. Um, and so I had these, these fears um, and uncertainties. And I entered her office with these fears and self-doubt, um, but also very excited um, that I was going to learn. I was going to gain knowledge and wisdom um, and kind of have, have greater opportunity because of going through this process. Um, and admittedly, on that first day, I didn't even know how to pronounce her name. Um, actually, either names. I, I, I kind of probably beat around the bush for the first 15 minutes and um, tried to kind of figure out a way to get her to say her name so I wouldn't uh, embarrass myself. Um, but she, she, she greeted me with a, with a smile. She asked me to sit down. Um, and we proceeded to actually talk for um, a couple hours. And um, we talked about my life and my family and my teaching experience, my experiences in Baltimore City Schools, my hopes and, and, and dreams, um, which I thought was really interesting um, going into a, starting a PhD program and having somebody talk to you about those things. Um, and she asked me what I was most proud of in my life. Um, and then she kind of told me that this was going to be a, a process that um, we go through together. And she also warned me um, that graduation would come sooner than I expected. Uh, and at the time, I, I thought to myself, like, yeah, right. Um, uh, and, and there was always these types of little things between us where Hannah always made me laugh. And so the first day that I met her and she said that after going over a program plan and talking about this thing called a dissertation and looking at uh, research methods requirements, I, was, I, I, I kind of chuckled at the idea of it. Um, and so this was, the, this was the start of our, what became a friendship that spanned eight years. Um, and she changed my life o over the course of that doctoral program. Um, and I, I quickly learned the importance of her work and her, and her writing. And so a lot of people today have been, been talking about that. And so some of the things for me that, that resonated were her insights in ed leadership and, and school community relationships and how she considered schools and school leaders to be change agents and, and organizations and actors who can really bring about social justice. Um, but also thinking about the constraints uh, the institutional constraints to, to, to some of these ideas in theory and, and how they translate to practice. And as I moved through my, my doctoral program, um, I worked in school administration in D.C. public schools, and so sometimes there were these very high theory conversations, and sometimes there were these holy crap conversations, what am I supposed to do? Um, that it, she somehow was able to bridge that knowledge um, for me on a regular basis and also keep me very very grounded. Um, so across her work, again, as people have been saying, she deeply explored the politics of education, power dynamics that serve as barriers. Um, and, and those were things that I really took with me as an administrator and that, um, because of her, feel compelled to still think about and write about and talk about today. But all of the stuff that she, all the content, knowledge, all the articles, all the things that um, I would say she made me read, um, that's not what I benefited the most from. Um, I benefited the most um, from seeing her be who she was. Um, she exposed me to these traits and passions um, that scholars and researchers and mentors and leaders and, and probably most importantly that, that human beings should have. Um, she was a, she, she's a process-oriented person 
um, that would never give you an answer to a question. She'd never give you a, 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 an answer for free, which this, this hugely bothered me throughout my dissertation process. Um, and I can still like literally recall thinking in my head, I, I can remember moments um, where I were either on the phone or on Skype or whatever technology she was trying out at the time that I had to um, endure. It's like, why can't she just tell me um, what she wants me to do? I don't understand why a dissertation can't just be, tell me what you want and then I do it and then, and then, and then it's done. Um, but in her world, um, research questions, methodological considerations, conceptual frameworks, all these things required patience. Um, rigorous reflection, and then further analysis, and then careful revision. And, and honestly, initially, I, I saw this as just extra work, um, especially as a, as a kind of juggling a work and school at the same time. And I would complain to her, and I would complain to anyone else who would listen, um, but, but all of my complaints, they never seemed to change the way Hannah um, behaved, and she always held me accountable to this, to this higher standards. And, that's what I saw in her scholarship, that scholarship for her was not a simple routine or a prescribed activity. And she always pushed us, and I say us, the, the group of doctoral students at Maryland that she really pulled together to think beyond what we already knew um, and what someone else had already said um, and to actually make a meaningful contribution to academic work. Um, and more importantly, um, she forced and uh, she really did force all of us, all of her doctor, doctoral students, to consistently engage with each other uh, by building a learning community, by reviewing each other's work, and by providing ongoing constructive criticism. And so, in, in a sense, her scholarship was not something that she just wrote, but it is something, it, it was part of the way that she also taught us and, and, and groomed us. Um, and I, I, again, initially, I hated this. It's like, I don't want to listen to everybody else's work. I, w I want just, you know, I want to present my work and see how I'm doing and then, and then go back and, and fix it. Um, and so that's a lot of my stubbornness that took years for, for, for her to break. Um, but I finally did really learn to trust in this process of, of engagement and scholarship and to seek out others w when I engage in work. And now I have this professional habit because of, um, either my stubbornness or Hannah's stubbornness, that, that you need to reach out and you need to work together and you need to be comfortable that there's not easy answers um, and there's, not, there's no such thing as easy scholarship. So to me personally, she was a scholar in the truest sense. She had a profound knowledge of her field. She had a sharp mind and was persistent about how she sought to engage in scholarship. Um, and at times, her knowledge and skill um, was very intimidating um, to see that. And I can remember thinking, and I, I still think this way, will I ever be that smart? Um, and she didn't take, and on top of being smart, she, she didn't take shortcuts, and she exemplified these very ethical values of a researcher, and she constantly preached the importance of an ethical and moral stance to her doctoral students um, as she modeled it in her work. So Hannah has published a lot. Um, over the course of her career. Um, and there's been this self-discipline and commitment to this scholarship. Uh, but what I found so interesting, um, and maybe another thing that I don't know that I can necessarily live up to, is that she valued each project, each activity, each paper, each presentation equally. Everything deserved 100% effort. And again, I, I wonder why, why would she work this hard? Um, especially on things that would not be fully recognized um, by others. And, and what I later realized um, was that she did these things because she had integrity um, and that she represented the professoriate at its best. And I'm only now starting to fully appreciate what that level of integrity means. She believed in her students and, and she fought for them. And just yesterday I met somebody and they looked at my name tag and they, they said, do I know you? And I, I, I don't think so. And they're like, oh no, yes, I remember you now. Um, when you were on the job market, Hannah locked me in a room and like wouldn't let me out. And I've subsequently heard that from a, from a whole bunch of people um, where boxed, I was boxed in, um, she wouldn't let me get off the phone, all of, all of these things. And so she, she, she was someone who, who fought very hard for her students and believed in them. And again, as someone, you know, a first generation college student, 
<laughs> when you have somebody like that, it, it allows you to believe in yourself because um, there's a lot of self-doubt that comes with doing graduate work. Um, so I'm well aware that my successes are not simply my own. Um, I was not prepared, um, yet Hannah made it clear to me that I would be successful. Um, she told me that I knew how to do hard work, and that's something I didn't know that I, I knew how to do. I, I didn't know that I could be successful um, in this field, but I knew that I could work hard. And she told me that through my hard work that success would come. And she counseled me as a teacher, as a school administrator, as a doctoral student, and um, as a faculty member. I had the world's greatest advocate when I decided to transition from a school administration position to a faculty position. And then going back to either my stubbornness or hers, she had been working on this for probably my entire doctoral program. Um, as you're going through that process, um, she told me not to worry, not to waver. And, and in all honesty, without her, I probably would have given up um, on this career path. But we talked every few days while I was on the job market. We talked about strategy, how to market myself, um, and the research I would conduct as I moved forward. But also, again, back to what, what does this actually mean to be a scholar? Um, we reviewed countless presentations and job talk interviews. Um, she meticulously critiqued me, my comments, my writing. Um, and like I said, when I got hired at UTEP, um, I, I received many, many conversations about how Hannah did not let them get off the phone until um, they were fully convinced that I could do all these things that, that, that she believed I could do. Um, so I have a huge debt to her. Um, and so as we've heard, Hannah's scholarship has been significant and it's impacted um, thought and many people's work. Um, but scholarly contributions, you know, they're often measured by your, your vita and by citation counts. And as an untenured professor, these measurements, they seem very, they seem very important. Um, and many of us pursue them tirelessly. Uh, but they're small and, and, and very insignificant in comparison to the types of contributions that, that Hannah made to her friends, to her family, um, to the University of Maryland, to students, to mentees, to colleagues, to, to everyone who came into contact with her. Um, so in Hannah's more than 30 year career, she contributed to new and ongoing conversations about democracy, community engagement, the role of schools and social justice. She inspired and guided many, in including myself, into the rank of the professoria and into educational leadership positions. She was a close friend, a dedicated mentor, and a colleague um, that I know we'll all miss. I want to thank everybody here for sharing their reflections. I wish we had time to hear yours, but given the banquet schedule, we need to close this session, at least in its formal sense. But I know that all of us will carry the memories and the contributions of Hannah in our hearts forever. Thank you so much for coming, and we look forward to informal conversations about Hannah and her work with you the rest of the evening. Thank you.